This is Brian from PassTheCase.com, and today I'll be going over the Case Interview Masterclass. First, I'll give a brief overview of the seven areas of the case interview. Second, I'll deep dive on the strategies, tactics, and common pitfalls in each of the seven areas. And third, we will then go through an interactive, full-length case interview where you will have the opportunity to practice as well as reflect on your performance. Now, we are using YouTube's new video functionality called YouTube Premiere. So this lets all of you and me experience this class at the same time. The benefit of this approach is that I'm always on and available to take real-time questions in the Q&A chat throughout the entire length of the class. So the moment you have any questions, feel free to ask right away. There is no need to wait until the very end. But if you do want to wait until the very end, that's fine as well. I will also be on for the last 15 minutes to answer any remaining questions. So with that said, let's get started on the first topic, which is a brief overview of the seven areas of the case. Now, the case interview is really just a way for the firms and interviewers to assess your consulting skills across problem solving, critical thinking, driving to insights, creativity, and communication. So in any given case, you can think of it being broken down into seven main areas. And while all consulting firms may have their own minor nuance, almost all of them follow this general approach. Their structure, also known as problem solving or laying out your approach, there's analysis or examining and uncovering the key issues or probing. The third is insights or finding the nuggets or getting to the so what. There's math or conducting quantitative analysis and reasoning. There's creativity, which is ideas or brainstorming. There's the recommendation, with this, which is synthesizing and putting it all together, and then communication as well. So that's the general structure and flow to a case. And the key to case interview is really focusing on improving your skills in each of those seven areas. And the best way to maximize your odds of case interview success is to focus on improving your skills in each of those areas and going from good to great. And so with that said, let's move on to the next topic where we are going to deep dive in each of these areas and discuss the strategies, the tactics, and the pitfalls to avoid to help you go from good to great. The number one most common mistake is candidates use a framework that is too broad. When interviewers give a case prompt, there are facts and hints in there that can help identify relevant issues given that case context. And many candidates don't pick up on this, and instead they try to recall from memory standard frameworks that are most similar to this type of case. The second most common mistake happens when candidates use what I call a canned framework. Now this is very much related to the first mistake. What makes it come across as canned is that it's simply more obvious that the candidate is blindly pulling a structure from memory without really thinking about its applicability. And the last common mistake happens when candidates don't describe and appreciate that drivers are dynamic in nature. For example, if the candidate identifies revenue as a key issue, they'll mistakenly talk about the drivers in a clinical or static way and say the drivers of revenue are price and quantity. Now, while this is true, it's much better to put this into in the context of the case. So for example, if we know from the case facts that revenue has been declining, then we should talk about the drivers of revenue as dynamic. Namely, the revenue decline issue could be due to a change in price or a change in quantity. Now let's talk about the three strategies on how to craft a great case structure. And hang tight because we will go into great detail on each of these strategies in the following slides. So first, you need to have a deep understanding of the question and make sure that you understand the case context thoroughly. Second, you need to make sure you're identifying those key issues, what I call 
the first level issues. And then third, you need to find the key drivers behind those first level issues, what I call second level drivers. So let's discuss the first strategy, deeply understanding the question and case context. First, you need to write down the key pieces of the case setup. Doing this will help you to put together a more relevant case structure. Second, you should jot down the questions and underline the key words. It's very important that you actually write out these key questions because it helps you contextualize everything and not get lost in the weeds later on in the case. This is very important. Put a big box around it, underline them, whatever you need to do, make sure those key questions are easy for you to reference whenever you need to. And then third, again, be careful about being too fast to type the case as a standard type of problem. Remember, the number one common mistake I see candidates make is that they have a framework that is too broad. Now let's discuss the second strategy, identifying the relevant first level issues. First, you need to spend time actually thinking about the problem at hand. Lots of people use the time trying to recall from memory the standard framework that the setup is most similar to. But remember, you need to use this time to really think about the problem critically and not just go into doing mode too soon. Second, let those hints and keywords that you've underlined help you identify the relevant topics. Again, the trick here is to use those hints to avoid coming across with too broad of a framework. And third, remember that cases often have more than one key question to answer. Therefore, you need to make sure you're creating an approach to solve both questions, not just one. Now let's discuss the last strategy, which is recognizing and contextualizing the second level drivers. So first, you need to talk through the drivers in a way that demonstrates you have a deep understanding of the problem. Remember, drivers are dynamic in nature and should not be talked about in a clinical fashion. Second, recognize the two very common tricks that happen in almost every case. One common trick is what I call the segment layer. Segments can be different products, geographies, customers, channels, etc. It's important to always think about this relevant segment layer in your structure. The other common trick is to think about changes over time. Again, drivers are not static. So you should almost never just ask for what the data is today, but rather what has happened in this driver over time? Has it gone up, down, or stayed the same? And third, you should talk about the drivers, but make sure you're contextualizing why it's relevant to the case context. You don't want to just list a bunch of second level drivers blindly. You want to tie everything back to the case facts so that everything comes across as relevant to the case situation. Again, if you write down the question and underline the keywords, it'll help a lot in contextualizing everything. Now that you have the three strategies of how to create a great case structure, it's very important that you understand the difference between good versus great performance on this dimension. I found that candidates typically make three types of mistakes in the examining and uncovering part of the case. The number one most common mistake candidates make is that they don't state hypotheses on why they want information. You should never just ask for data in isolation. The word hypothesis seems to scare a lot of people. Instead, think of them as educated guesses at the answer to a problem. You should state a guess of the answer so that you're asking the right questions to either validate, invalidate, or refine that working answer. The second most common mistake is when candidates don't use their structure as a guide. If you follow the strategies outlined in key number one, your structure will help you a lot 
as part of examining and uncovering. You simply go down the relevant issues you've laid out and probe on the second level drivers that you mentioned. You state hypotheses, ask the right types of questions, and either X out issues that you find not to be relevant, and you go down paths that seem to be where the problem lies. You let your structure be your guide. The last common mistake happens when candidates don't pick up on the interviewer's cues or guidance. For example, if the interviewer says something like, that's a really good question. We'll share data on that in just a few minutes. What else would you like to know? That's a cue to you that you may have very well hit on one of the key nuggets. And the interviewer needs to make sure you're asking the right questions to X out and at least explore and rule out other areas on your issue tree that you laid out in your structure. Now let's talk about the three strategies on how to be great at examining and uncovering. And hang tight because we're going to go into great detail on each of these strategies in the next slides. First, you need to always keep in mind the key case question or questions you're solving for. It's very easy to lose sight of this. And if you don't have it written down and starred or double underlined, you might lose sight of it. Second, you need to have a hypothesis driven approach throughout. You need to know the reason why you're asking for data and asking the interviewer questions. Remember, you're trying to validate, invalidate, or refine that educated guess of the answer. And third, you need to adopt what I call an ownership mentality. This is your problem to solve. It's not the case interviewer's problem. And when you adopt that ownership mindset, that will help you be hypothesis driven throughout. So let's discuss the first strategy. Always keep in mind the case question or questions you're trying to solve. First, you need to be oriented around those key questions that you're seeking to answer. Again, write it down, double underline it, circle it. It sounds simple, but many candidates do not do this and they forget the original questions when they're down in the weeds. It's easy to do, so don't make that mistake. Second, remember that your structure can and should be used as a guide for your line of questioning. Your structure can basically be thought of as an issue tree and you are exploring all the key branches or issues of that tree. And third, again, sorry to harp on this, but do not forget to write down those questions. I've seen this problem time and time again. There's a lot of information that's uncovered in the case and the original case questions oftentimes get lost. Don't let this common mistake happen to you. Now let's discuss the second strategy, which is being hypothesis driven and know why you're asking each question. First, remember that hypotheses are just educated guesses at the answer. When you ask for data, you should lead with stating a hypothesis and providing the rationale for why you want to know certain information. Again, having those key questions written out or in the back of your mind will help you do this. Second, remember to listen for the interviewer's hints and guidance. If it appears that you've hit on something important early on in the case, again, the interviewer will still want to make sure you know to ask the right questions and rule out other issues at play. And third, remember to use your structure as a guide. X out those issues that appear to be dead ends or irrelevant. And remember, you need to think like an investigator as if you were solving an important murder case. Now let's discuss the last strategy, which is realizing that this is your problem to solve, not the case interviewer's problem. First, realize that your chair in the interview room is actually the driver's seat. You should have this literal mindset because it'll help demonstrate greater enthusiasm and provide greater mental energy towards solving the problem. Second, keep tabs on your timing. The case interview goes quite fast and there is only so much time for the interviewer to cover all seven keys with you. Therefore, make sure you're being hypothesis driven so that you're asking questions with purpose. When you do this, you'll save a lot of time in your line of questioning. Third, if you don't understand something or you need clarification, do not be afraid to ask. 
Many people make the mistake of pretending they understand something in the hope of displaying confidence, but it comes back to bite them because they didn't really understand what they were told. Again, don't be afraid to ask for clarifications. Now that you have the three strategies of how to be great at examining and uncovering, it's very important that you understand the difference between good versus great in examining and uncovering. I found that candidates typically make three types of mistakes in identifying nuggets. First, it's important to know that this key is often tested when you're given charts or tables or exhibits to make sense out of. And so the number one most common mistake is when candidates just read off the slide or exhibit. Now, it's fine to read off what you're seeing to digest the information. It's fine to think out loud. However, the mistake is when candidates stop short and they don't take that extra step of putting it all together and identifying the key nuggets or getting to the so what or what matters. The second most common mistake is candidates who get overwhelmed with too much information. Some cases purposely put extraneous information in an attempt to make it harder to identify those key nuggets. The last common mistake is taking too long to get to what matters or getting to the so what quick enough. But don't worry because I'm going to introduce a framework to help make this process faster. Now let's talk about the three strategies on how to be great at identifying nuggets. And hang tight because we're going to go into great detail on each of these strategies in the next slides. First, you need to use my HTW framework to help you get to what matters a lot quicker. Second, you need to always be thinking about second order effects or what I call potential implications or considerations. And third, you should always be thinking about what's next. What else do you want to explore from here? So let's discuss the first strategy using my HTW framework for getting to what matters faster. First, you should read the title of the exhibit so you orient yourself on the exhibit's purpose. This is also known as a headline. Second, you should try to identify the key trends that you're seeing. This will prevent you from merely reading off the chart, which again, is one of the most common mistake candidates make. Third, you need to explicitly state what matters. This is the key nugget, the key insight, the so what, whatever you call it, this is the thing that matters. Again, having the original case questions written down will help a lot with this. Now, let's discuss the second strategy. Always thinking about possible second order effects or implications and key considerations. First, if you identify a key nugget, think about a key risk or consideration of whatever that thing is. Is there an important key risk or consideration to raise? This will show that you're thinking in a deeper level than most candidates. Second, it also helps if you put yourself in your client's shoes. Again, if you have the mindset of living the problem yourself, it'll be much easier to think on your feet when it comes time to identify a key risk or consideration. And third, be very careful about only saying the obvious. You need to differentiate yourself. So once you've identified the key, what matters, see if you can think if there's anything else important to mention. Perhaps the key what matters is that the client should clearly enter a certain market because it's growing fast. But maybe there's also data that shows that they should clearly exit a declining business. Don't forget to say that second point too, again, if it's relevant. Having your case questions written out, again, will help with this. Now let's discuss the last strategy, which is being proactive and thinking about now what, or what's the next area you want to explore or thing to know. First, once you uncover the what matters or the so what or the key insights, that should be a trigger to get your mind thinking about now what. Second, again, try to live the problem. If the case protagonist is the CEO, then adopt the mindset of the CEO as best you can. 
Remember, this is your problem to solve, not the case interviewers. So what else do you want to know if you are in fact living the problem? And third, don't rely on the interviewer to be the one to guide you to the now what. Remember, if you've identified what matters, it is up to you to drive to where you want to go next. What's next area you want to know more about? Now that you have the three strategies of how to be great at identifying nuggets, it's very important that you understand the difference between good versus great performance in this dimension. I found that candidates typically make four types of mistakes in calculating math. The number one mistake candidates make is not finding the shortcut approach to the case math. In other words, they do it the long way, and this leads to having them calculate a lot more numbers, and it basically increases the chances of making errors. That brings me to the second most common mistake, which is making too many errors. A few small errors start adding up when your competition is not making any of them. Unfortunately, these little details do matter. The third common mistake is not being organized. You're oftentimes given the question, you might get some new numbers, you'll have an exhibit, and then you're actually making math calculations. And these numbers often get mixed in with each other, which again, increases the chances of making calculation errors. And then the fourth mistake is not being aware of all the case writers landmines that they purposely put in the math portion of the case. But don't worry because I'll reveal the most common types of tricks that are embedded in most cases. Now let's talk about the three strategies on how to be great at calculating math. And hang tight because we're going to go into great detail on each of these strategies in the next slides. First, you need to know three powerful shortcut hacks that will greatly reduce the number of calculations you need to do. Second, you must be organized. You should keep calculations separate from other information. And third, you need to be aware of the common landmines that case writers purposely put in the case to trick you. So let's discuss the first strategy, knowing the three powerful shortcut hacks. The first hack is what I call the incremental profit magic formula. And this shortcut can be used whenever you're dealing with a change in mix, and you need to calculate the incremental impact from a change. So for example, if the mix today is A, and the mix in the future will be B, they want you to calculate B minus A. So whenever you find yourself in a situation like this, you can use this hack, which is the fact that incremental profit equals incremental revenue times incremental margin. To see how this can be applied to a case, be sure to check out my practice case interviews with me program, where I actually show how this cuts your time by a factor of 10 X, no joke. The second hack is what I call the B equals MK shortcut. Whenever you have a number in billions, just write B. Millions is M, thousands is K. Then you can basically rearrange these letters in a formula to go a lot quicker. For example, 10M over 2K equals 5K because M over K equals K. Likewise, K times M equals B. It's a very powerful shortcut once you play around with rearranging the B's, the M's, and the K's. So go ahead, play around with multiplying them and dividing them, and you'll see how powerful this hack is. The third hack is what I call the absolute to ratios hack. If you are given absolute numbers in one situation, and you need to calculate absolute numbers in a future situation, you can use ratios to estimate how those original values would increase, decrease, or stay the same. Again, you can see a live example of this in my practice case interviews with me program. This trick will oftentimes cut the number of calculations and thus the probability of making errors in half. Now, let's discuss the second strategy, which is being organized in your case math. First, 
you need to write the key math question that you're answering and listen actively for additional math information that will likely be given to you. Write it down quick and ask for clarification if you didn't capture it all. Don't pretend to have gotten it all. Second, many people make the mistake of allowing their calculations to cross over into other information they wrote down. This gets them tripped up. So consider trying your calculations on separate pieces of paper. You can code them in letters like A for one sheet, B for another sheet, which allows you to tie back that calculation to other pieces of paper. Third, do spend some time to think about how to lay out a structure to the problem. Many people make the mistake of getting to calculations quickly without thinking about how to best solve the math problem. When people make this mistake, they often miss the shortcut approach, which could save them a lot of time and reduce their chances of making mistakes. Now let's discuss the last strategy, which is being aware of the four common landmines that case writers put in. First, there is what I call the install base trickery, which stumps almost everybody. Think platforms and accessories. If you are in the business of creating an accessory like a third party controller for a certain kind of platform, like a Nintendo gaming system, then you need to know the install base of all the Nintendo gaming systems out there, not just the Nintendo system sales in the last year only. Second, oftentimes there will be purposely missing information. You might need to ask for price or cost or cost to start up a business. Again, this differs by case, but know that there's information that you sometimes need to know to ask for. Third, sometimes information needs to be de-averaged. This is another way of simply saying broken down further. For example, if you know there is a basic and a premium segment in the market and the case interviewer gives you an average cost, then you should know to ask or explore if the cost is different by these two segments. And last, you need to always be thinking about how to contextualize the answer you calculate. For example, if you calculate the return on investment percentage, you should determine if that's a good outcome or a bad outcome given the case context and why you think that. So now that you have the three strategies of how to be great at calculating math, it's very important that you understand the difference between good versus great performance on this dimension. The number one most common mistake candidates make is not using a structure to help them thinking about ideas and options. It's hard to think on your feet and generate multiple ideas when you don't give yourself a framework for doing so. The second most common mistake is stopping short at just a few ideas. You need to differentiate yourself by having more relevant ideas. And the last common mistake is not highlighting some important key trade-offs or implications if you mention an idea. You don't want to just throw out an idea without having any considerations or thoughts about it. Now, let's talk about the three strategies on how to be great at generating ideas. And hang tight because we're going to go into a lot of detail on each of these strategies in the next slides. First, you need to use a relevant structure to help you generate ideas. Second, you need to realize that you often have to have a handful of ideas. Don't just stop at one or two. And third, you need to think about the trade-offs, the considerations, or the key implications of an idea. So let's discuss the first strategy using a relevant structure to help you generate ideas. Here are some common example structures that might help. Anything that's marketing or growth related could benefit from using the four P's plus S, product, pricing, placement, promotions, and then the often forgot about service. Now, if you're asked about factors that we should consider in doing anything, whatever that case context might be, a simple pro versus con framework could serve you well. If you need to fill in gaps and say capabilities, consider using the framework build versus buy versus partner. And lastly, if you're stuck and you just need a catch-all framework to use, thinking in terms of people, 
process and technology could help. Now let's discuss the second strategy, generating more ideas, but making sure they're relevant. First, you need to leverage a framework or structure to help you generate ideas. This will help you immensely in coming up with more ideas. Second, you need to make sure that what you're coming up with is somewhat relevant to the case situation. Don't just throw a wild thing out there to make it seem like you're creative. You need it to be relevant and again, remember to mention the implications or risks or considerations associated with whatever idea you throw out there. And third, push yourself for a handful. Many people make the mistake of stopping short. You want to aim for more relevant ideas. Now, let's discuss the last strategy, which is considering the trade-offs, the risks, the implications of an idea. First, remember to always be thinking about these pros or cons or trade-offs, risks, implications, whatever you call it, you need to remind yourself to consider these things after you just list an idea. Second, put yourself in the client's shoes and try to live the problem. This will help you a lot in coming up with that key risk or consideration to talk about. And third, remember to always think about these trade-offs and considerations. I know this is repetitive, but again, don't just list an idea without having anything more to say after it. You want to talk about that key risk or thing to think about. Now that you have the three strategies of how to be great at generating ideas, it's very important that you understand the difference between good versus great performance on this dimension. I found that candidates typically make three types of mistakes in delivering a recommendation. The number one most common mistake is not being structured. The second common mistake is that they take too long to deliver it and they're too wordy. And then the last common mistake is when they make a recommendation or recap findings, but it's not comprehensive in nature. Now let's talk about the RAN framework to help you deliver a great recommendation. First, you want to recap the question or questions from the client. And remember, you wrote these down as part of your structure. Next, you want to answer the question. You'll pull out those what matters or those so what's from the nuggets part of the case. You'll also add in any contextualized math answers that you calculated from the math part of the case. And last, you'll identify next steps. You'll do this by pulling in key options or ideas that you generated from the ideas part of the case. And you'll conclude with those key trade-offs and considerations or next steps, also known as the now what, that you wanna have the team explore next. And what you see here is that there's actually little new thinking involved. It's really just summarizing all the parts of the case together in this organized structure and you will have a significant advantage if you use this framework and see how the different parts of the case fit into it. Now that you know how to deliver a great recommendation, it's very important that you understand the difference between a good versus great performance on this dimension. I found that candidates typically make three types of mistakes in their ability to communicate effectively. The number one most common mistake is that they are not clear and they speak in too many generalities. The second most common mistake is that candidates are not concise and they're too wordy in their responses. And the third mistake is just not being confident. And this can show up in one's voice and body language. So the way to communicate effectively in your case interview is to always speak in three C's. Speak clearly, speak concisely, and speak with confidence. To speak clearly, you'll want to slow down and try to mirror the pace of the case interviewer. And make sure you pause, slow down, check for understanding when appropriate. To speak concisely, you can leverage structures to help get to the point quicker. Also, be cognizant of your time as the case does go by quite fast. Lastly, to be confident, you need to have a positive mindset going in. Be yourself, be authentic, have enthusiasm for solving the case. Instead of viewing the interview as a burden, see it as a privilege that you get this chance to interview. 
Now that you know to speak in three C's, it's very important that you understand the difference between good versus great communication. We'll be going through a case similar to the ones that you'll be asked to solve in an interview at McKinsey, Bain, BCG, or any other top consulting firms. Now, I will interrupt from time to time to share my feedback, so let's get started. Okay, well, that's all my questions with regard to your background. There will be a bit of time at the end if you have any questions for me as well, but I thought it would be good to go into a case at this stage and try to solve a business problem. So let me start off by giving you an overview of the client and the problem at hand. So our client is the new vice president of an internet software company that sells in a software as a service model. So they sell web experimentation software that lets clients conduct tests on their websites to see what works and what doesn't. Now the VP, He's a veteran in the software as a service industry and has realized in just his first few days with the company that profits on a per user basis are lower than competitive benchmarks. So he would like our help to understand why profits per user are lower than the competition and what actions they should take to improve profitability.
Sounds good. So it sounds like our client wants us to explore two specific issues. First, why are profits per user lower than what competitive benchmarks would suggest? And then second, what actions should they take to improve profit per user? Is that an accurate understanding of what the client's looking for? Those are indeed the two issues that he'd like you to dive into. And what is the geographic scope that he would like us to investigate? For example, is this a multinational business or should we focus our exploration on just one region? The company is headquartered in the U.S. and has all of its operations there, so just the U.S. will be the focus. Okay, and I assume the client wants to determine how to get to competitive benchmarks or is he looking for profitability targets over and above what benchmarks would suggest? Well, our client is focused on getting to competitive parity from a profit per user perspective. All right, that's all the clarifications I have for now. Do you mind if I take a few moments to put some thoughts down on paper? Absolutely, take your time. There are a couple of great things about this opening to the case. First, you'll notice how the candidate has done a great job to clarify the specifics of the problem. So he's not just determined that the client wants to improve profitability, but specifically wants to understand why profits per user are lower than competitive benchmarks. Second, notice how right off the bat, he's asking relevant, clarifying questions. He's asking about geographic focus, as well if there are any specific targets. Overall, he's showing strong drive to try and solve this problem. Okay, to understand why profit per user is lower than the competition, I'd like to understand three main areas. Our clients, customers, its products, and financials. I'd then like to understand kind of how these areas compare to that of the competition. Then once I have a fuller understanding, I'd recommend potential actions our client could take to improve profit per user. And this may include changing our pricing, lowering our costs, or moving to a more profitable product mix. So starting with the company, I'd like to learn more about our customers. Specifically, what are our types of customers and how do we segment them? I'd also want to understand how do their needs differ. Next, I'd like to learn more about our product portfolio. So what types of products do we sell and what's our product mix? Perhaps we're selling too much of lower profit products, which is lowering our profit per user as compared to competitive benchmarks. And then next, I'd like to dive deeper into our client's uh, financials. So within revenue, I'd like to understand pricing and see how may pricing have changed over time. And I'd like to understand volume and determine whether or not it has changed over time. Perhaps we've lost customers, which had the effect of spreading fixed costs over a smaller uh, customer base, thereby decreasing profits per user. And then within costs, I'd like to break them into fixed and variable costs and see if either have changed over time as a percentage of our revenue. 
uh, perhaps our labor rates for developers and designers are well above benchmarks, or perhaps our development efficiency is below par. And then last, I'd like to understand how we compare to the competition across the same dimensions, including the customer types and segments, the product portfolio, and the financials. The candidate is performing great on each of the key criteria in the structuring portion of the case. First, he's identifying relevant first level issues, which includes the company's customers and products, the client's financials, and then how these all compare to that of the competition. Importantly, his structure addresses both questions. Why is profit per user lower than the competition and what to do about it. Second, he's identifying most of the second level issues. So this means he's taking apart the first level issues and breaking them down into its component parts. So for example, the client's financials are being broken down into its component parts, including price, volume, and costs. And then third, he's showing a deep understanding of the problem. And he demonstrates this a few different ways. First, he adapts his structure well to the case context. And since this case is about drawing comparisons of profitability between the client and the competition, he is explicitly seeking to probe on this comparison. Second, he is contextualizing the drivers by wrapping them into the case situation. So you'll notice he doesn't talk about costs in a generic fashion. Since he knows this case is about software, he puts costs in the context of software, talking about costs related to developer spend or development efficiency. And then last, he's signaling his thinking. At times, he mentions why he's interested in probing certain drivers. So when talking about product mix, he offers a thought that perhaps the client is selling too much of lower profit products, which is lowering their profit per user. And as with the introduction to this case, he's again showing strong case leadership and drive. Great, now go ahead and let me know where you wanna start. Well, I'd like to start by better understanding the financials, starting with revenue. Uh, specifically, how has our pricing changed over time and how do our prices compare to the competition? Perhaps we've decreased prices uh, compared to the competition, which has effectively lowered our relative profit on a per user basis. Well, we do know that the client's prices haven't changed and we can share pricing for our client and the competition in a later exhibit. Okay, it sounds like price changes may not be a factor. Uh, I'd like to then dive into the cost side. So within costs, uh, have either our fixed or variable costs changed over time as a percentage of revenue? I'd like to understand how this compares to the competition. And I'd also like to understand if our customer volumes uh, have either increased or decreased over time, uh, because perhaps we've lost customers, which lowers profit per user, uh, since our fixed costs are now spread over a lower base of volume. Well, I can tell you that our fixed costs and variable costs are in fact in line with the competition. Uh, we also haven't seen any significant decreases in customer volumes. Gotcha. So it sounds like neither price changes nor cost changes or not even volume changes may be factors. So I like to switch gears and learn more about our customers and products. So starting with our customers, I'd like to know who are the types of customers we sell to 
how do we segment our customers and how do needs differ by segment and I'd also like to understand how does this differ for the competition. Within customers, we sell to three primary types of customers, small businesses, medium businesses, and large enterprises. Now, we don't have specific information on needs, but we, we do know that the size of the business roughly correlates to their degree of marketing analytics uh, sophistication. Uh, in terms of the competition, their customers and segments are in fact quite similar to ours. Gotcha. I'd like to then learn more about the product portfolio. What are the types of products we sell, uh, our product mix, and how that compares to the competition? Since price, cost, and volume uh, changes weren't factors, I'm thinking perhaps we are selling more of lower profit products than the competition is. So do we have information on mix differences? Well, we sell three different tiers of our product, uh, standard, professional, and premium. And whereas our competitor has four tiers, uh, we do have information about our client's product mix and our competitor's mix, and it is indeed different. So let's go ahead and review that information now. Again, the candidate is performing great on each of the key criteria in the examining and uncovering portion of the case or the analysis piece. So first, he's often probing at the driver level, right? For, for example, he's not just asking about the products themselves, but is probing deeper on what the product mix is and how that may differ between the client and the competition. Second, he mostly states the reason behind asking for information. So for example, he mentions that the reason he wants to know, know more about mix is because since he had already ruled out price, cost, and volume changes as factors, mix differences could be an important factor. And since he explains that the client could be selling more of lower profit products than the competition, mix differences could in fact account for the client's lower profit per user on a relative basis. So again, the candidate is showing strong case leadership and drive and great energy to solve this problem. Here's the data that the client just provided. Take a moment to read through. What are your observations and takeaways? Okay, I'm seeing several differences. For one, in the standard package, we are including advanced audience targeting, but the competition is not. And while in the professional package, we are not offering advanced audience targeting, the competition is. And then second, in the premium package, the competition is providing the enhanced security controls, but we're not. And then third, we don't have an ultra premium package, but our competitor does. And then last, I can see that the competition is selling more higher end plans than we are. So in looking at all this, it seems like we are giving too much value away in our standard package, which is likely our lowest priced offering. And this could also explain why we would have a much higher mix of customers in our lowest priced offering versus the competition. So to increase our mix to higher end offerings, we should look into reducing the features in our standard package and look to add more valuable features into our professional and premium packages to make them more compelling. Uh, however, we'd want to be careful not to overstrip features out of the lowest end package and make sure to use appropriate messaging so that we don't cause customers to switch if we don't handle that well. And we should also look to add in an ultra premium tier to capture those customers who are likely looking for the best of the best and may not care about price as much. And I'd also like to understand how are we pricing our plans and how does this compare to how the competition is pricing? Because perhaps we are either overcharging or leaving too much money on the table. Another strong performance. The candidate is performing great on each of the key criteria 
in identifying the nuggets or the insights or the so what, right? So first he's identifying most of the key insights here. While there is a lot of information to digest on the exhibit, he's able to pull out the two key nuggets. One, the client's likely giving away too much value in their lowest priced offering, which is explained by the high mix of users in that uh, package. And then two, there's an opportunity to make higher end plans more compelling by shifting features from the lowest tier into the highest tier plans and offer more valuable features to them as well. Next, he's also thinking about implications. So when he suggests potentially reducing the features in the lowest tier package, he's careful to note the trade-off of potentially causing customer frustration and subsequent switching to a competitor and even discusses how to mitigate it. And then third, he's proactive in thinking about what he wants to know next, right? Continuing to drive the thinking, specifically probing about price tier comparisons since the client may be overpricing or underpricing versus the competition. We do in fact have information on pricing. The client has shared an exhibit with the following information. Uh, they'd like you to calculate the precise increase in average revenue per user in dollar terms if the client were able to match both the competitor's mix and pricing. And then once you've done that, they want you to estimate the percentage increase that that represents. Okay, let me start off with the first question, which is, what is the incremental average revenue per user in dollar terms if the client matched the competitor's price and mix? Okay, in thinking out loud here, I, I could approach this by calculating a weighted average using the old pricing and old mix, 
and then calculating another weighted average using the new pricing and new mix, and then subtracting the two results. However, since the client is looking for a precise answer, I think this would involve a lot of math calculations. So I think a better approach to solve this problem is to break incremental average revenue per user into two components. So first, how many incremental users are on our new plan paying this new price? And second, how many old users are on our new plan paying an incremental price? And then I would just calculate these for each of the four plans and sum them all together. So starting with the ultra premium plan, I have two incremental users paying the new price of 299, which is 598. And I have zero old users since the ultra premium plan didn't exist. So that multiplies out to zero. And then on the premium plan, I have two incremental users paying the new price of 199, which is 398. And I have 12 old users paying an incremental $50 each, which is 600. Uh, so then moving to professional, I have 11 incremental users paying the new price of 99, which is 1,089. And then I have 30 old users paying an incremental $20 each, which is 600. And then lastly, moving to the standard plan, I have 15 fewer users paying the new price of 49, which is uh, negative 735. And I have 58 old users paying the incremental zero, which multiplies to zero. And so now I'll just sum the totals here. So put a zero here, carry the two, that's five, carry the two, that's five, carry the one, that's two, okay. So a client would expect to get an incremental 25.50 in average revenue per user if they were to match the competitor's pricing and mix. And so with that, let me go ahead and estimate the percentage increase this represents. So to do that, I'll just take the incremental ARPU of $25.50 I just calculated and divide that by the old ARPU. All right, so the old ARPU will just be the old users multiplied by the old price. So since the client never had an ultra premium package to start with, I'll just start with the premium package. And since the client just wants an estimate, um, okay, so that's 10 old users times $150, which is 1,500. For the professional plan, that's 30 users times 80, which is 2,400. And then for the standard plan, that's 60 users times $50, which is 3,000. Um, so summing those for roughly 7,000, which is about 70. So 20 over 70, I know is uh, 28. 30 over 70, 42. So 25 over 70, right in the middle, right? So roughly 35% increase. And that represents a pretty significant increase for a client given that their business model is based on a recurring revenue stream. This is a great performance on the math section of the case. Let's look at the criteria. So first, the candidate didn't make any errors. Second, he found a shortcut by simplifying the math to break incremental average revenue per user into two component parts. And he called out this approach at the very beginning so that the interviewer could basically follow his thinking. And then third, he got the answer right and put it in context by putting it into percentage terms quickly and noting that it's a significant increase in the average revenue per user given the client's business model of relying on a recurring revenue stream. Okay, let's say we go ahead and change our price and improve our offerings. What are some ways the competitor might respond and how might it affect us? Okay, so I can think of three things. So first, the competitors may also lower their price. And so we might need to assess to see if it makes sense to match. But this could lead to a price war. And it might make better sense to add more value to our offerings uh, or try to keep the price more or less the same. And then second, the competitor may increase their promotional spend to uh, acquire new users or offer incentives to keep their existing customers. So we might want to think about switching incentives to get customers to move over to our product. And then third, the competitors may add new features to their product offering to basically try to make them more compelling. So we might want to think about 
what features we could add that customers would, would really value. And not just meet competitive parity per se, but also think about those that ideally would surprise and delight our customers. Uh, perhaps features that automate experimentation or automate report generation. And then since we know that kind of the higher end packages correlate to those large enterprise customers, we may want to think about exploring adding in value added services like faster support or more dedicated account managers or other service oriented features and determine how to operationalize them quickly. Again, a strong performance on the idea and creativity section of the case. Several relevant ideas are mentioned here. Assessing the price match due to competitor price changes, assessing switching incentives due to a competitor change in promotional activity, and adding in differentiated value due, com due to competitor product changes. So first, these are all relevant ideas that were mentioned, some non-obvious, like adding in more service-oriented features like support or dedicated account reps and not just packing in in-product features. Um, ideating on ways to surprise and delight users instead of just trying to match competitive feature parity. And then also considering trade-offs and, and other considerations throughout. So for example, when talking about the competitor potentially lowering their pricing, he points out that an assessment would need to be made on whether or, or not it makes sense to price match since that move could potentially trigger a price war and a race to the bottom. So let's say the senior VP walks in and wants a quick overview of your findings and recommendations. What would you tell him? Sure, so we explored why profit per user is lower than the competition and what to do about it. We found that we were adding too many valuable features in our lowest priced offerings, which therefore made our higher end offerings less attractive. And if we were to reconfigure our packages and line our pricing to match the competition, we would gain an additional $25.50 of average revenue per user or roughly 35% more than we have today. So we recommend reducing the features in our standard packages and add more valuable features to our higher end packages to make them more compelling. So this could include not only in product features, but also service oriented features, including things like enhanced support or more dedicated account reps where it makes sense. So as a next step, we should assess how competitors may res respond to our changes and this may include them making pricing, promotion, and product changes. We may also want to explore our own marketing spend and explore loyalty incentives to keep our customers from leaving our platform since we are relying on a recurring revenue-based model. Closing out the case with a strong performance on the last section as well. So let's take a look at the criteria. He did a great job of succinctly recapping the question. He answered the question by incorporating the insights found, namely that too much value was being put into the lowest tier package. He puts the average revenue per user increase and percentage uh, appropriately into his recommendation. And then lastly, does a great job in clearly highlighting the key risk areas in regards to how a potential competitor might respond and the associated next steps. Overall, this is a model interview. The candidate is outstanding and it's a rare example of performance that is really strong across the entire board. So let's look at communication, which is assessed across the entirety of the case. You'll notice that throughout the case, the candidate often speaks with strong confidence, clarity, and concision. So let's do a quick recap overall on why this candidate was outstanding. The first key, structure. He identified the relevant first level issues. He dove into those second level drivers and he showed a deep understanding of the problem 
by contextualizing everything to the key situation. The second key, analysis, he probed his questioning at the driver level. He stated the reason behind asking for information and he synthesized along the way what he was learning throughout to know where to probe next. The third key, insights, getting to the so what, he got to the so what, that key insight of providing too much value in the lowest tier package and thought proactively about the know what, namely what to do next, right? Reconfiguring packages and adding more value to the higher tier plans. The fourth key, math. He found a powerful shortcut approach to this math. He was fast, he was accurate, he put the answer in context, talking about how the opportunity is sizable given the recurring revenue model. The fifth key, ideas and creativity. He offered several relevant ideas, like thinking about service-oriented features, and mentioned considerations and trade-offs of ideas, like pricing changes that could potentially start a price war. The sixth key, recommendation. He provided a solid recap of the question, answered it, including the insights he found, and provided a very clear overview of the risks and next steps. And then the seventh key, communication. Throughout the case, he spoke in the three C's, with clarity, with concision, and with confidence. So thank you for watching this till the end. I would now like to present you a special offer available for a limited time only. Just check out the messages in the chat right now for the link and discount code to the Power Program. I'll be on chat for the next 15 minutes to help answer any questions. Thanks for watching.